I'll get us started off. Thanks again for everyone for tuning in today. Um, you can keep introducing yourself in the chat, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome to today's Lunch and Learn, uh, which is put on by the Coastal Hazards Resilience Network, or CHURN, um, which for any new folks in the audience today is co-managed by the Washington State Department of Ecology and Washington Sea Grant. Um, CHURN has an uh, overall mission to strengthen the resilience of Washington's coastal communities through collaboration, education, and knowledge exchange. So we have a really great website that provides a curated selection of relevant science, best practices, and other resources um, related to coastal hazards. So it guides you in the process of learning about coastal hazards. It directs you to Washington specific tools and resources, and it provides you with examples of projects happening along the coast and connects you with people who are involved, um, in that work. Uh, so as part of the knowledge exchange portion of our mission, we host an annual meeting every year to bring together coastal practitioners, and one outcome of the 2023 annual meeting was that folks were really asking for more frequent opportunities for knowledge exchange and connections. Um, so uh, yeah, alas, we launched the Lunch and Learn system, um, or the Lunch and Learn events, and which started about a year ago um, to be able to get at this opportunity for more interaction and knowledge exchange. We also do host a listserv where we share announcements like the Lunch and Learn announcement. So make sure you sign up for that if you're not a part of it so you don't miss any announcements of upcoming opportunities. And then uh, today, Specifically, an, uh, one other opportunity for networking that we have launched based off of feedback from the 2024 annual meeting, um, we are starting to offer some virtual drop-in office hours for churn. So our first one will be today, immediately following this Lunch and Learn event. So I'll share the link in the chat if you want to hop into that. You can just come say hi to Henry Bell and I. You can provide us some updates with what you're working on. Um, ask us questions, anything like that. And um, a bit of an overview of what you can expect for today. Um, our Lunch and Learns are meant to be two-way conversations. So while there is a presentation, please feel free to interact with our speakers and ask questions. Uh, you can raise your Zoom hand or you can plop questions in the chat um, and we'll make sure that we get to those. Uh, we also do have some USGS Cosmos folks in the attendance today that can help with any more technical questions, um, which is really helpful. Thank you for y'all being here today. Um, and then since it is relevant today's topic, I just wanted to draw folks' attention to the landing page for Cosmos efforts in Washington, um, which is also on the CHURN website. So there are helpful resources there, including a, a link to a recent training on the groundwater products. Uh, COSMOS stands for Coastal Storm Modeling System and um, is a USGS tool that predicts the combined impacts of coastal storms, sea level rise, and river flooding at the local scale. And today we'll learn a little bit more about how it has been used in COSMOS so far. Uh, which brings me to introduce today's speakers. So Kurt Baumgarten and Chris Elder are with us today coming from the Port of Bellingham and Whatcom County to talk to us about the Whatcom County Compound Flood Vulnerability Assessment, um, which does include the use of Cosmos data. So Kurt and Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. And I will pass it along to Kurt to kick off the presentation. All right, thanks Chandler. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Kurt Baumgarten, environmental planner with the Port of Bellingham. And um, I'm gonna go over here to the screen share. And let's get over. Okay. Sorry, I had this set up a second ago. And um, let me get underneath here. All right, so I'm gonna back out of that just for one second. Um, stop. So much for having it set earlier. Okay, how's that look? 
Looks great. Good deal. Um, okay, so what um, Chris and I are going to do today is give you a local perspective on, um, you know, since we've had the Cosmos data from USGS for several years, we've uh, initiated some some efforts towards um, applying it at the local level. And, um, and so I'll start with the, the ports perspective, which is, you know, hyper local. Um, we're uh, non GMA planning, so um, we're we're not under the same same regulations that in a port that the cities and counties are. We're not. We don't have a, a comprehensive plan to update. Um, so <clears throat> we don't roll out any sort of uh, codes or, or regulations. Um, we're uh, in fact, you know, subject to the jurisdictions that we're under. And for Port of Bellingham, that it would be um, City of Blaine, Whatcom County. In the city of Bellingham, and um, to my knowledge, right now there is no necessarily no statewide um, or state-driven effort to to compel ports to do anything specifically with sea level rise. So it really is whatever comes down from the jurisdiction um, to to the ports or whatever ports initiate on on their own. And so to that end, um, about four years ago or so, the the city of Bellingham. The Port of Bellingham and Whatcom County partnered and uh, contracted with USGS to to do the uh, coastal storm modeling for Whatcom County, and, and that made us the first county in the state um, to have that that level of of resolution of data and modeling uh, for you know coastal storms related to sea level rise. And so I'm just going to walk you through a little bit of of how we started to incorporate that kind of some of the issues um, that the port has. Um, and uh, so, so a little background, a little bit of, of how we bring the modeling in, some of our current conditions, and then um, some of the early adaptation we've started to, to incorporate um, into port planning. And so I think it's important uh, for, for a lot of folks who don't aren't aware um, to understand that, that most uh, waterfronts, like the Port of Bellingham, are by and large built on fill. And so the red line that you see there represents the approximate location of the historic shoreline um, for Bellingham and for, for Blaine. And so everything waterward of that red line um, is, is fill on historic tidelands. It's all roughly the same elevation. And so it will uh, all roughly experience sea level rise um, at, at a similar rate. Um, so it's kind of frames the magnitude of the problem for, for many ports in my mind that, um, you know, there's going to be similar impacts happening around um, waterfronts all around Puget Sound. Um, and so it's uh, having this, this uh, the Cosmos tool available to be able to start looking ahead at potential scenarios um, is going to, you know, prove to be uh, very, very helpful in, in future planning efforts. And so um, we, we see about um, you know, just a few, you know, not very many inches of sea level rise at this point, but um, various presentations I've gone to lately and going through the University of Washington data, you know, we see anywhere from um, a foot and a half to, you know, two and a half feet um, anticipated um, by 2100. Um, and so some of the things that we're looking at right now for Port of Bellingham in, in some of our lower areas are uh, a major transportation corridor, um, Squalicum Way, that connects, basically connects the waterfront of Bellingham with um, I-5 and, um, and is, is key transportation for uh, not only employees, but for moving uh, goods and, and uh, back and forth from uh, cold storage and from our harbor. And so um, we, we frequently have uh, king tide events um, in, in Squalicum Creek area. And um, and this is this actually isn't even as bad as it, it gets. We've had you know cars floating through this intersection, and um, had the um, during heavy uh, storm events, the creek itself uh, will jump out of its its current channel and flood the road that you see off kind of to the right of the picture with the red car. So it's a pretty significant problem um, for us in that area. We've had other areas of of some you know moderate storm damage um, back in 2018. Um, that necessitated repairs. Um, and so we're just really kind of starting to see the early effects. Um, here's another, you know, another king tide more recently that um, 
really kind of shows that we're we're hitting the the, the extent in, during certain events um, of our infrastructure, uh, what it was designed for. And so, um, and this is um, just a king tide event without any associated storm surge. So it's starting to definitely highlight um, what we're going to be seeing more and more of in, in the future. Not atypical for you know other places around the sound. Um, the area that I'm showing you right now uh, on the in the photo on the left, it, I'll I'll just in a couple slides at the end here, I'll, I'll uh, show you we have a project going on there right now, and we're um, taking um, steps to remedy this particular situation um, of this this high tide uh, flooding uh, right up into our buildings and through an area that's an active boat yard. So for planning purposes, and this is where the Cosmos model fits in, um, we, you know, we've, we've been using and, and looking at for years the, the sea level rise modeling out of the University of Washington Coastal Impacts Group. And then um, that, you know, that kind of helps you frame the timing of things uh, that may occur under a variety of assumptions that you make, you know, for, for for future condition. And then, then we would look at, you know, the, the coastal storm modeling system for that more objective look of, well, what does any given sea level rise combined with a storm look like? Um, and then with that, we also developed the climate action strategy for the port that uh, has embedded within it a master list of, of resilience actions um, that, that really run the gamut from planning activities all the way to, to capital, um, you know, small and large dollar capital projects. And then to, to further look at um, adaptation and vulnerability, we did a port-wide vulnerability assessment, a, again, a, a high level planning tool, um, and then started to drill down on a few different geographic areas of the port. Um, things that are they're fairly obvious, but then we put a, a finer point on it with exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Um, studies to to start looking really at specific infrastructure with uh, more ground truth GPS uh, points so that we have a much better idea of, of elevations. And, and that work would then eventually lead into um, more uh, site-specific capital projects. So as I mentioned earlier, one of our first stops for kind of getting our head around what things could look like in the future is, is the University of Washington modeling. And if you haven't gone and looked at this, I do encourage you um, to, to check out the, the projections that they have and, and, and kind of to toy around with the, the different, um, I'm assuming you can see my cursor here, but you, you get you know, the ability, if you haven't looked at this, to choose um, what RCP, you know, what representative concentration pathway of 8.5 or, or 4.5, um, I tend to go, you know, since I'm not seeing the progress we all had hoped for, I tend to go for the 8.5. And then you can pick um, various levels of probability of, of an event occurring. And so, um, and then you get these, these outputs and you can adjust the time horizon on it as well. And so for, for, for the Port of Bellingham, you know, we see this, this span of potential outcomes as um, time goes on, depending upon what risk level you're willing to take um, for a given, say a given project or asset. Um, the other thing we did is we took the, the Cosmos modeling and had a in-house uh, sea level rise viewer um, built. And so this is a web-based GIS viewer that we stuffed all the data in it, and I have to say, in retrospect, and, and we're working on a update to this. We're gonna. It's a hefty data set, and somebody else from USGS could chime in if they want on on the the system needs for for actually hosting a set like this. But it, we had some troubles getting it to work um, quite right, and so we're we're adjusting just how much of the data we're gonna present. Um, and what's really needed. But basically we threw every bit of it in here. And so you could look at all the different scenarios that Cosmos um, modeled for, for Whatcom County. And we did it countywide. We'll probably shrink it down to just the port for the next version. Um, but it's been very helpful because I can share this viewer and have with our engineering staff. 
And so um, they're able to play around with it and get an idea of, you know, what things could look like in the future under different scenarios for, for port properties if they're considering, um, you know, a, a planning area or if they're considering a specific project, an asset that's, you know, a high dollar asset with a long life. Um, and so for our, for our vulnerability assessment, we modeled, uh, we, we took outputs from the model of um, a variety of scenarios and they became an appendices to, to this uh, vulnerability assessment. And so for our decision makers and for anybody who wants to see uh, kind of a narrower range of scenarios, um, we're able to um, to have that already graphically depicted without having to go into the into the viewer or anything. It's all within our vulnerability assessment. And then we did like a heat map for that as well, just kind of a different way of viewing the same the same data. Um, and then for the the ESA analysis, um, we we basically um, rank things. It's it's a you know a bit subjective when it comes to this part of of doing these these types of events uh, or excuse me this this type of study and different different um, folks will slice it a little differently, but basically, you know, you're, you're high, you're, you're, you're assigning a, a high, medium, low relative ranking um, based on, you know, exposure sensitivity and the ability to adapt uh, a given asset. And so everybody seems to approach it slightly differently, but in the end, what I've seen is, is um, you know, you come up with just the kind of a relative ranking of things that can help you for budgeting. It can help for for longer term capital capital planning, and um, I should have mentioned earlier. Um, so ports don't plan under GMA, but we we do have um, enabling RCWs um, from the state that require us to have a, a scheme of harbor improvements that every capital project has to be in. So in looking ahead at those projects, uh, we. We we bring in this information and, and start to think about you know longer term what are we going to need to be doing so that's the planning level you know we're at and you know Chris will talk a lot more about what the county's doing um, comp plan wise excuse me okay um, so one one recent project uh, was a um, a habitat beach project it was a forage fish project uh, Little Squalicum Beach um, on, on Port property. And um, the goal here was to uh, get some um, riprap material, some broken up concrete, some um, you know, filled in wood waste out of the environment and to create a beach. Um, we also wanted to make sure that, that this particular area was going to be able to sustain, um, given the surrounding elevations, as long as it could, um, in you know, in the face of uh, sea level rise, and that this is at the head of the bay, and there's quite a fetch that leads up to this. So uh, it gets, um, depending upon the direction of the prevailing winds, it gets uh, quite a bit of wave energy. And so it was designed in such a way, and you can see the stats there, um, to to sustain as long a period of time as possible. And so that did wind up elevating the back beach um, above the area behind it, and we'll have to eventually blend that in as we do some more upland improvements. But it's a kind of part of a phased in approach for this area to try to get some long term resilience. Um, so back to that that other project, um, which is it's currently under under construction. Uh, it was impractical to elevate the entire area that that this this um, project is part of um, due to the existence of buildings that have plenty of life left in them, um, but the finished floor elevation is 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 lower than we would be looking at in the future. Um, but those buildings will stay for a while, and so the approach that was chosen was to basically create a berm in the area where where we're experiencing the the flooding, and that was a new one for the city of Bellingham had had not had anybody propose anything like that, and so. There were some lessons learned and some, you know, it was a, a process to, to go through that because that wasn't something they've had an um, application for under uh, the shoreline program. 
And so it allows for us to further elevate the site um, inland um, later. Um, we're doing some stormwater improvements with this, with this project to prevent any um, flooding back up in the site. And, um, and then the berm itself can be adapted uh, moving forward. And, and then for our uh, upcoming um, Squalicum Harbor upgrades, um, we are going to be looking at, at uh, the whole suite of infrastructure to both um, both uh, future proof against sea level rise and and uh, tsunami effects to the extent that's practical given the surrounding elevations. And this is, I think, will be a theme that um, people will be hearing in the future uh, as you look at these projects and you look at what you can pull off on a you know project by project basis. There's going to often be in these filled environments a lot of uh, challenges with kind of the upstream infrastructure that that like for us there's the railroad behind us and then there's also a lot of port or excuse me city infrastructure that we don't have control over so I I feel like what we're doing is we're 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 starting to identify a phased uh, approach to adaptation and um, doing the best we can uh, given you know, on a project by project basis and given what the, basically the prohibitive costs would be to start elevating the entire area at, at this point. Um, so that's that's what I had for everybody. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions now or we can take more at the end. I, I'm not sure if there's any coming through in the chat right now either. Hey, Kurt, there was one question in the chat, but it looks like our USGS folks are on it. And yeah, just for everyone's awareness, we have Eric Grossman, Patrick Barnard, and I think Maya Hayden from USGS. So they're here to help answer questions. We have one question for you, Kurt. Um, have you identified any flood proofing strategies? Flood proofing, so like for foundations? Uh, for port infrastructure. Um, we, things we've talked about is, uh, would be like raising critical electrical infrastructure up a certain elevation inside buildings. We, we did, um, one of our focus areas was our maintenance shop. And we looked at the possibility of, there's been talk of, of perhaps moving that entirely. But in the interim, when we got a handle on on what what types of periodic flooding we could expect coming in the in the near future, we talked about um, possibly elevating. and um, and then also, I mean, if you look at some of the FEMA um, work that's been done around flooding, there's, uh, let's see, elevating area, do you mean elevating structures or assets? Um, structures would be great to elevate, in, you know, because but there, that's a much more capital intensive approach. So I'm talking about um, infrastructure within a building, say, if you have a, you know, a, a bunch of elect electronics or communications equipment that's lower level, um, it can be brought up higher to at least survive some level of inundation um, when when you're dealing with um, salt water that stuff gets very sensitive and, and it really gets to the point where you can't you know you just can't have it and so um we also i think we also identified measures to temporarily um block doors um do extra gasketing um and so those will all be things we'll be looking at you know moving in the future um i, I hope that's that's answering the question danielle had yeah, perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thanks. I think um, seeing no other questions in the chat, we can probably move on to Chris's uh, presentation. Okay, thanks Chandler. And thanks, Kurt. Um, I said one quick question um, is if anyone knew you know, the real reason why sea level 
sea levels are getting higher. And there's one theory out there that it's because of all the, the seaweed. Uh, just Googling some tacky uh, openers, see if that did the trick. Um, but thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I'm a senior planner with Whatcom County Public Works. And I've been supporting uh, climate-related planning for the county for about six or seven years since the county first uh, enacted its Climate Impact Advisory Committee. Um, and it is great to see folks like Era, Eric and Maya and Patrick on the line, uh, as well as Guillaume and a lot of our other project team members. Oh, I have a little partner on my back. Um, but uh, I guess a lot of what I'm going to try to go through today is really comes down to like advance. Um, a lot of the partnerships that I rely on to make this um, to make this fly. Um, so there's a lot of data that comes in, both from the U.S. Geological Survey, um, as well as the Climate Impacts Group, um, our partners at Department of Ecology, DNR, Washington Sea Grant, and all of our local jurisdictions in Whatcom County. So I've had the benefit of serving as the project manager for phase one, which was completed last uh, June, I believe. And we're just in the process of launching down uh, this phase two rabbit hole. Um, so we were lucky enough to receive Department of Ecology funding through their, um, I'm, gonna get the, I'm not going to try to remember exactly what it was called, but basically to help local jurisdictions um, incorporate climate change and sea level rise into kind of local planning processes. And um, so everyone likely in this group already knows this, but we do have enormous amount of kind of uh, resources developed largely by Department of Ecology and partners um, available to support local jurisdictions in developing their own sea level rise planning parameters. I think all of you are familiar with with um, the regional uh, representative concentration pathways and the high emission scenarios and the low emission scenarios. Um, I know there's little uh, debate or discussion around, you know, which scenario or likelihood um, jurisdictions should, should consider. I think a lot of us are in the camp that that RCP 8.5, the business as usual, as it's referred to, is kind of where we're at. And I think planning around that uh, pathway seems most appropriate, um, certainly if we're trying to be conservative and considerate uh, moving forward. Um, so this you know, graphic is for Whatcom County coastline and certainly uh, was developed by the Climate Impact Group. And you can kind of see the, the wide range and variability. This is just for that representative concentration pathway of 8.5. You know, we have an extremely high degree of confidence that will, uh, well, I should, maybe I'll, I'll rephrase that. You know, there is a, a very small uh, likelihood that we may experience a pretty enormous amount of sea level, uh, sea level rise over time. So I think just seeing the, the widespread of potential scenarios has um, been super helpful for us trying to consider how do we present this to our elected officials and leadership um, moving forward? And you'll see, as I described some of our project, um, how we try to set those sideboards out uh, for, for folks to consider. So um, here's just kind of a graphic of where we were trying to uh, line out the scenarios we picked. So I guess, you know, a lot of what we came from, so certainly Cosmos data has been critical, you know, Kurt, Reference a little bit, but you know, Whatcom County had the benefit of being one of the first, or I believe the first um, community in Washington state to have the Cosmos data set um, completed. So some of the scenarios we were select uh, we selected were based off of uh, pre-run scenarios that the Cosmos made available for us um, through that 0 0.8, 3 3.3, and 6.6 .6 feet of sea level rise scenarios. And you can see on the right side there, um, we were able to add on the 100-year uh, storm event, king tides, 20-year uh, storm events um, for those very scenarios. So in that right block, those are the multiple scenarios that we were able to apply across the entire Whatcom County shoreline uh, to complete our vulnerability assessment, which was part of our phase one project. And on the left, if you look at those UW Climate Impact Group projections, um, we've had a lot of debate at the project team level 
of trying to consider how do we present this both to the community, to staff and to electeds. And there's always that question of, you know, you know, when, when is it going to hit? When are we going to hit that 0.8 feet of sea level rise or 3.3 feet? And that's a hard, if not impossible question for someone like me, or even all the scientists on this call to, to answer definitively. Um, so we tried to kind of demonstrate that there's a range where, you know, that 0.8 feet, there's a 10% likelihood or less that we'll hit that mark between 2030 and 2050. And there's a 50% mark that will hit that uh, by 2060 um, for that 0.8 foot scenario. But again, this is, you know, some of the challenges we tried to overcome in messaging and communicating on um, our degree of confidence. And again, trying to line out for electives and staff, you know, what is the range of um, confidence we have in the data? And I, I will say maybe just, just briefly more on this data point. I got interviewed by a newspaper in Gig Harbor, I guess, last week. And there was a lot of questions around um, around Cosmos and, uh, you know, data confidence. And I, I know when I present to my elected officials, um, there's always that question of, you know, what what data are you using going into this? And, you know, yeah, how, how confident are we in that? So it's been extremely helpful for me to be able to, you know, point blank, uh, point back to the Cosmos data and our USGS team and partners and, and demonstrate that, you know, we, we've got the best best science available. And I can say that uh, with a straight face to electeds and whether or not they believe me, that's that's on them. But um, I'm super thankful to have that data to inform this process. So one thing we try to do in Whatcom, um, having the Nooksack River flowing into Bellingham Bay and Lummi Bay uh, was to try to incorporate not only changes in sea level surface, um, but also try to factor in some of these projected future high flow events. Um, so that term generally uh, compound flooding is the intersection of coastal and riverine flooding. Um, but actually talking with some partners just yesterday, you know, there's other um, compound components such as groundwater infiltration or um, stormwater outflow. So, you know, the, the compound flood effects, not only of sea level rise, but also of the other water inputs to a system. Um, so the rest of my talk is really going to try to focus on where we go from here. Um, I did see that, uh, so I guess I'll back up one second, you know, phase one, we were able to have the support of ESA and they were a great partner to help us kind of get our arms around uh, what uh, what does a sea level rise vulnerability assessment project look like? Um, and for phase two, we'll be working with Herrera uh, through this second round of ecology funding to try to take that foundation we had with sea level rise vulnerability assessment and try to move it, you know, one step further into figuring out where do we go from here. So phase one got us to a point of um, completing an exposure analysis for the entire uh, marine shoreline and a portion of our lower Nooksack riverine shoreline. This phase two will actually complete the, the comprehensive vulnerability assessment for the entire marine shoreline. And we have the added benefit of actually going upstream up the Nooksack River all the way to our uh, community of Dimming, which is where the three forks of the Nooksack come together and also include um, an, an overflow corridor up to Sumas and into Canada. So pretty exciting. We have some pretty robust river marine planning uh, processes underway, but they've never kind of done this future future climate modeling process and trying to evaluate vulnerability based on those different future climate scenarios. The second big part of our project is going to be developing a pilot adaptation plan. I think we're on the hook for the grant to develop a, a specific adaptation plan for one um, frontline community. Um, phase one, we looked at Birch Bay uh, as far as the complete vulnerability assessment. I think there's some indication that we'll probably pick that area for our phase two, but that's subject to project team approval. We've had some interim discussion of also looking at a community along the river as well. And the other significant piece of this is that we're trying to develop um, adaptation strategies that can be applied more universally across the marine shorelines, both um, lowland inundation areas as well as areas that are more susceptible to increased bluff erosion due to sea surface uh, sea surface change. And I will just pause for one second. One, one extra benefit we have, um, you know, having Eric Grossman, our USGS partner and kind of Cosmos lead um, available locally, he's been working with a grad student up at Western Washington University to actually extrapolate how bluff erosion rates will change over time under different sea level rise scenarios. 
So part of our uh, phase two project includes partnering with Eric and his grad student um, to try to help um, complete some of this assessment and integration with Cosmos to have the bluff erosion component be directly linked up with uh, with different sea level rise scenarios as well. So that's pretty exciting and new. And then the third part of our project is going to be considering how do we implement those adaptation strategies through local planning documents and local planning programs. Um, so, you know, zoning is a big one, the shoreline management program, is another significant one. I know the Department of Ecology um, is just starting their own process to figure out what sort of tweaks need to occur to fully accommodate or incorporate impacts of sea level rise, um, critical areas, and potentially other land use regulations. And then we've got some of our more uh, kind of public works or infrastructure planning processes, which are more programmatic, um, transportation improvement plan, capitals, facilities plan, et cetera. And, you know, just a brief example, had a meeting with some of my public work staff probably three or four months ago, including our roads department manager. And we have one road up off of Drayton Harbor, um, which is uh, significantly undercutting just due to some of the significant storm events that have occurred lately. And they kind of recognize that there is nowhere, nowhere good to move the road. They can no longer move up, up slope. So they opted to kind of complete the road repair according to current standards, um, but recognize that that was probably the last time that we'll be able to uh, to complete according to current standards um, based on the level of impact we're projected to experience. So you can see with a lot of uh, different public works managers that the reality of these impacts are starting to become more and more real. Um, I think everyone on this call probably is familiar with, you know, what vulnerability is, but just, you know, briefly exposure is just the level of inundation or impact we're going to experience. Uh, sensitivity is how sensitive is that asset ecosystem building infrastructure to that exposure. Um, and then adaptive capacity refers to what options do we have to, to adapt or kind of recover from those, those impacts. And that gives us our overall vulnerability score. I know Kurt gave one example of how they've um, kind of visually represented uh, vulnerability. This is a snapshot from our phase one assessment. Um, and it is interesting, you know, to, to me as staff to, to look at something like this, which, you know, demonstrates for Sandy Point. And that's, that's a picture of the Sandy Point fire station that got um, inundated, I believe, in the December 2022 storm. Um you know, it's like we got a lot of we got a lot, a lot of red on that table there. Um, there's a lot of highly uh, vulnerable or sensitive assets in some of these communities. So on the one hand, that helps give me a sense that we should put more energy or more planning priority along Sandy Point. Um, but I have the question of yeah, how does this actually allow us to to move to move the dial or prioritize our efforts? Um, so just, you know, kind of circle briefly, this is the complete marine shoreline assessment for Whatcom County from our phase one vulnerability and just circled, you know, a uh, king tide under a 0.8 foot scenario. If you look in that first or second, so, you know, we've got roughly a little bit less than 500 buildings, largely residential homes are going to be significantly impacted under a 0.8 foot silver rise scenario. And then if we go up to that max, um, 6.6 .6 feet with a 100-year storm event. Uh, we're looking at almost 3,000 uh, 3, homes. And if you look at the, the road um, version as well, so 11, 11 miles of road under that 0.8 feet, or it jumps up to almost 80 miles of road under that 6.6 .6 foot scenario. Um, so it's it's uh, highly significant, as I think everyone on the call knows today. But again, trying to set out those sideboards for elected officials to demonstrate, um, you know, a lot of the question comes down to what what level of risk are we going to plan for? Do we want to plan for one foot of silver rise? Do we want to plan for three, six? Um, you know, what's going to be the most responsible way to support our communities and steward public resources? And just, you know, uh, jumping into the adaptation strategies a little bit, you know, we're just about to launch, I guess, our contract with Herrera and Western was just approved just last week. So we have not even had our fully pulled together project team meeting yet. Um, so we're going to jump a lot more into this over the next nine months. 
but I think there's a recognition that you know there are multiple adaptation strategies which I'll rattle through briefly here in a second. But I think we all recognize that the resulting implementation is likely going to be a hybrid approach to all of those. Some of it's going to accommodate in place. Some's going to require some degree of protection. And in a lot of places, we're going to have to see some significant retreat. And I have heard that uh, some people don't like the word retreat because it implies that we are losing or giving up. And possibly the term relocate might be a more, uh, more uh, tolerable term uh so just real quick you know that kind of defend protect in place you know there's the hard structures which um I believe generally ecology and a lot of staff are trying to prevent further armoring of the shoreline um and then there's the more natural approach which would be revegetation or natural wood installation beach nourishment um which uh, i believe department of fish and wildlife has a shore friendly program um just met with the northwest straits foundation yesterday to learn a little bit more about some of their implementation of the shore friendly program in whatcom county accommodate kind of the, the elevation structure how do we um how do we support uh, infrastructure kind of that last question that kurt got uh, what can we do to maintain systems in place for as long as possible and then the retreat or relocate how do we halt or limit development in these known inundation or bluff erosion areas and what do we need to do to help support getting property owners or individuals out of the danger zone as well as how do we support relocation or um, removal of public works infrastructure in hazard zones you know, there's a whole suite of programs and policies out there. There's a whole suite of tools we have available to us. Um, I know having worked in the planning department for five years and now having worked in the public works department for five years, not all of these planning processes are great at communicating to each other. Um, so it's been the additional challenge of how do we how do we make sure that our natural hazards mitigation plan is informing where we uh, develop or how we develop our capital improvement program or our transportation improvement plan? Um, so you can kind of see the nuance, um, you know, where we're at currently. So Whatcom County is a 2025 um, comprehensive plan update calendar. So I think we're due in December 2025. Uh, House Bill 1181, the new climate change um, add-on is something that we're right in the middle of grappling with. Um, my counterpart, Lauren Clemens, the county's climate action manager, is on this call as well, and we're trying to work together with our consultant group to complete an update of our natural hazard mitigation plan, just to get a better sense for you know what existing hazards already exist, and then try to add on that additional layer of how do we expect these natural hazards to be exacerbated uh, over time? So not just sea level rise, but some of the other potential uh, climate impacted hazards. And then there's the, the challenge, you know, some of the language out of House Bill 1181, you know, essentially instructs us to not allow or not promote additional densification in known climate impact zones, which could be riverine floodplains or future riverine floodplains, um, as well as, uh, coastal coastal habitats um and so on so it's a it's a pretty interesting challenge we have before us a lot of good data a lot of good folks trying to support us but how do you change um i think that's what climate change challenges all of us to do is how do we change our business as usual approach of government which operates as um the environment being a, a static ecosystem if anything, that sea level rise and coastal vulnerability has kind of demonstrated to me is that you know we're no longer working in a in a static ecosystem. The ecosystem is dynamic, and I think a lot of our regulations and planning processes um, and programs also have to be dynamic. So that is the the challenge before us. Um, so in this presentation, which I'll share with Chandler um, once we're done here today, I've got a link to our kind of landing page, which has our phase one assessment complete document, as well as a couple of our public um, facing reports that we shared out with the community during development of that phase one assessment. And we also have a story map that kind of runs through a lot of what I covered today, 
but additional scrutiny and links um, and an interactive web viewer where you can actually play out those different sea level rise scenarios, sea level rise and flood scenarios across the marine shoreline. So I think uh, with that, uh, thanks for letting me ramble at you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris and Kurt. Uh, that was really great. Um, yeah, feel free to come off mute or raise your hand and ask a question or you can drop them in the chat. We do have one um, from earlier that is uh, a question of, is decreased vulnerability always an increase in resilience? I was mulling that over and I <laughs> said, it's a, it's a very broad theoretical kind of question. Um, I mean, I would guess maybe not always, <laughs> I'll punt. Um, if, I mean, generally speaking, sure, if, if something is, you know, less vulnerable, it, it may be more, you know, resilient going out in the future. Um, but I don't know if there's like a direct, necessarily direct relationship. Is that, I don't know, anybody from USGS or Chris, I mean, is that, what do you guys think? I mean, it's a good first go. I mean, I guess yeah, decreasing vulnerability is a great strategy but if you're if you're just building something less resilient in a different location i don't know yeah, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it's a one for one necessarily probably need yeah, more I mean, the way i was asking the question because i was just wondering uh i've been looking for a definition of uh, resilience and so i was now I, I thought that maybe there was a potential of having a way of anchoring the terms resilience in something concrete so that's why i brought that up yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer for that. That is an interesting topic. I know at uh, Washington Sea Grant, we've had lots of conversations about the definition of the word resilience. Um, I might move on to one of the next questions, which is how does Whatcom County approach when to abandon a road? Yeah, so, I mean, that's part of where, so I, I referenced that we have this whole project team, I think one piece that I kind of glazed over, you know, one of the reasons why we um, designed it or proposed it as such, on the one hand, you know, people like myself and Kurt and Claire Fogelsong from the city of Bellingham have been, you know, informally, formally meeting for a bunch of years trying to wrap our brains around how do we, how do we share information and kind of collaborate on implementation of a enormous challenge before us? Um, so this whole concept of if we can do this vulnerability assessment or shoreline solutions development process as a team, you know, certainly the county is the fiscal agent. Um, I'm going to be taking the results of both our projects back to council, but I've also created an equal playing field where, you know, Kurt with the port or Alex with the city of Blaine can similarly take that data back to their electeds and be able to um, communicate back to them. They're not beholden to the same recommendations I make to my council, but we at least are operating off the same playing field and trying to trying to share that data. And I think I lost the rest of your question. What was the other part of the question? When to abandon a road, Chris? Oh, right. <laughs> Which you so, sort of you sort of hit on that earlier, right? I mean, so you know the. Hopefully, I mean, as we develop our pilot adaptation plan, as we develop some of those adaptation strategies. So, you know, come June 25 next year, we'll have our complete phase two assessment, which has the, the comprehensive vulnerability assessment for the entire marine shoreline and as well as our future riverine shorelines. We'll have our pilot adaptation plan and our adaptation strategies, and we'll have our recommendations for improvements to not only our comprehensive plan, but also our transportation improvement plan. And one of the recommendations that we might make there could be to adopt a three foot or six foot level sea level rise um, scenario. And if council received that and we adopted it, then they would essentially have to modify their road building standards to accommodate that. So I've been trying to kind of give my public works managers a little bit of a heads up, um, shared them the phase one report, tried to kind of walk them through what it indicates. So they're aware of it and chewing on it, um, but we're probably going to require some degree of council action before we adopt a higher road, road impact standard. Thank you. 
Let me see Charlotte's hand was up earlier. I don't know. Charlotte, did you have something you wanted to throw in there? Oh, I had a question for you, <laughs> but okay. I, I wanted to see if others had questions. <laughs> I can ask it. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, well, also, thanks for the great presentations, Kurt and Chris. It's always really, um, really wonderful to have the opportunity to hear kind of the, the story of, of your work and, and all the you know great leadership in this space. Um, my question is for Chris. Um, you know, I think you're a few months out now from completing that phase one um, project, and I'm just curious about how it was received kind of across the county and different communities, if you got a lot of like reactions, um, you mentioned you're getting interviewed by papers in Gig Harbor, <laughs> like did it make a big splash or was there kind of a change in tone? Um, or do you think that, you know, is kind of yet to come in terms of public awareness and just kind of general reactions? Um, I think it was well received in a lot of regards. Um, you know, I, I kind of referenced back to having the Cosmos data was pretty critical. I mean, I, I do recognize having run several planning processes that if if there's low confidence in the data, um, it's hard to go almost anywhere. And, you know, even certain council members were attempting to poke holes in the data, as it were. Um, but even some of my more conservative counselors, when they kind of saw the the writing on the wall or the outputs from our phase one vulnerability. Um, I think they were kind of rightly alarmed and wanted to to jump into some of the the solutions of trying to move to action a little quicker. I think the, so that, you know, that initial reaction in one meeting has not translated to actual action or kind of persistent ongoing interest. So, you know, I guess having been a staffer for more than a minute now, um, it's easy to get a little um, disenfranchised or disillusioned that, you know, you bring something significant. You know, I read the results of this report and it's like, oh, oh shit, this is a uh, highly significant. Um, and I am hopeful that once we get this phase two and we actually have, you know, more concrete strategies and more concrete recommendations that that will give council something to actually grab onto and move forward. I, I do recognize that a lot of elected officials get bombarded with so much stuff. And if we don't provide them with a clear recommendation, um, it's almost difficult for them to act um, decisively as well. There was, there were a number of, of public meetings for this, um, right, Chris? I mean, you guys definitely did some outreach and for the ones I attended, it seemed that there were people who were really grateful to finally be seeing this type of information out in that public space. You know what I mean? Because people have been reading and hearing about this, but until it, it you start talking about it relative to your neighborhood or your, you know, your area, which is what we can do now with, with this more site-specific modeling. Um, I, I thought I saw a lot of people really, I mean, some people were really kind of taken back, like, uh-oh, depending on where they lived. Um, but, but it, it, um, uh, for, for the, for those public meetings, I, I saw the attendees definitely, um, glad that this was, this was out and the public, it's like the beginning of a public conversation really. Right. And so I think that to that extent, that first phase to me seemed pretty effective. And I think, you know, the flip side of the, the other side is that there's a lot of coastal residents that are already experiencing impacts and they have their own complaints around permitting for hard armoring or relocation or elevation. Um, so I think we're a little additionally challenged that we, we don't, I think there are complaints about our current shoreline code and ability to respond to existing impacts, let alone this, you know, magnificent <laughs> concept that oh it's going to get you know one two three foot deeper water in the future so um i know people places like birch bay which is a large retirement community there's a lot of elderly homeowners that were hoping to live out their days there and you know it's hard i mean this is a huge huge stuff we're talking about that i think it's difficult for a lot of individuals to even wrap their brains around you know what what did you say how deep is the water going to be um so yeah it might take a little time to sink in Thank you for that. Um, 
I see, Christina, I see your comment in the chat. Are are you able to come off of mute and, and chat about that? Two. Hi, all. Uh, thanks for my, the thoughtful presentations. So my thought is in reflecting and processing all of the different scenarios and high risk and mid risk and low risk, like the adaptation just seems like we're going to hear from insurance agencies and lending institutions faster than our frankly government codes are going to catch up. We're going to hear 50 property owners can't get insurance and they can't get lending when they want to sell their houses. And I feel like that side of it, we have to be ahead of socially, economically, like the idea is like, you know, would we have any kind of state or county buyout program in flood areas? Do we have an ability to create those local adaptation strategies that can be piloted with grants from the federal FEMA government agency or ecology shoreline program? You know, and do we have any kind of way to provide even smaller upgrades? like we do for water conservation, you know, low flow toilets and low flow shower heads. Like, can we provide some kind of smaller incentives for homeowners to be able to work with contractors to lift their electrical panels, to get their furnaces off the ground level? Like, are there anything concrete that when you are sharing information with this, like the public, that we can say like, yeah, this is a lot and you've lived here 50 years and now this is just different. So how do we get out ahead of that, given new data that we're seeing and modeling that's going to be shared more widely? Great, great question, Christina. Um, I, I don't have a, a great <laughs> answer. I mean, that's uh, that's kind of what I've, you know, I feel like we brought this. We have a little bit of a, I mean, I guess in my cli climate uh, perspective, it feels like we have a little bit of a golden era here of like there's the next five, ten maybe 15 years before the impacts really start hitting super hard where ideally, yeah, local governments should be going fast and furious. How do we support people in either getting out of the danger zone yeah. or at least accommodating it for the interim? Um, so yeah, uh, there are funding sources out there. Um, I know we've applied for a couple, uh, you know, uh, Snohomish County applied for a big $40 million dollar uh, NOAA Resilient Communities Grant, which yeah. we were not selected for. So I don't know, yeah, getting getting dollars big enough to actually have an impact um, and having the staff capacity to do it seemed to be bottlenecks. And, and I think having list of contractors qualified, having those who have already gone through a county bid process or a, a vetting so that when you get those calls after the flood, there's a way to direct resources to folks of who is le legitimate, who could actually help them versus calling somebody who says, sure, I'll come out and help you and have it be way worse on the insurance side. You know, So any kind of resources that can be provided of folks that are um, verified, that have the right training and the right programs in place to help both individuals and commercial businesses, I think would be really helpful as resources. And I don't know if it's up to the county to provide that or a chamber of commerce or some kind of, you know, small business public works list that you guys already have for other contracts, you know, where there would be resources that um, the county could have to provide to homeowners or businesses who would be in this inundation zone, not by their choosing, but now they're there. And what do they do now? You know, That's thank great you. Idea. Thanks. Definitely. Thank you for that. Um, I want to be mindful of our speaker's time. It is past two o'clock. Um, if, if you have a few more minutes to stand for some questions, let me know if you need to go. Also, we can end uh, today's conversation. How, how do you feel, Kurt and Chris? I'm okay for a bit. Yeah, I'm okay for a few minutes. Yep. Sure. We can stay on for a couple more questions. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if we have accidentally skipped any questions in the chat. Um, we have some- Chandler? Yes. Oh, sorry. I just was noticing there was a question about, um, I think to both Chris and Kurt about how the efforts were funded. Yeah, I think that would be great to talk about. Yeah, maybe I'll just kick it to Charlotte to give the correct name of the funding source so I don't- Put your 
Yeah, so the Whatcom County um, grants are from the Shoreline Planning Competitive Grant Program, which we had a pilot round um, during the, I guess that would have been 20, 2021, 2023, and then a second round during 2023 to 2025. Um, and we anticipate that there will be funding in the next biennium, but we're kind of trying to figure out how to um, kind of most strategically align those funds with the needs. Um, and then um, those funds go back towards a supporting um, general shoreline planning, um, you know, master program updates and things after that. And so I think it's a, you know, a question ecology shoreline management is definitely exploring is, um, you know, what additional funding might we need to ask for to support um, all the planning work and then uh, let alone the implementation work that um, was part of the previous discussion. Kurt, I can't, you know, I don't know if, I oh, don't think that was ecology money that the port's been using no i mean for yeah. for the for the vulnerability work that the that you know the county's been working on yeah that was all ecology money but for for the original um you know doing the cosmos modeling and working together um you know city port county i know for the port that was that was the money we put in our annual our annual operating budget um and then the the subsequent vulnerability assessment that we did um same thing that was just me you know working with my supervisor putting putting that forward as like hey we've got this this data and this tool now this you know basically the the best available science um let's see what we can do site specific for for the port and um and so i i i see it you know we we kind of push it along and learn some stuff and then we take the the next step um, and, and look at what our next, you know, round of budget round is and what we need to do. And so it's, it's sort of, we're just trying to kind of build on it and, and internally. Um, and of course, if there's, if there's some grant funding out there and, and, and I'm trying to basically get, you know, some capital projects together and things that we, that would be, um, competitive in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Atul, do you want to Come off mute. Sure. Uh, I have a, another uh, question. I was wondering, is there any way for uh, local government staff who are doing the modeling to work directly with the insurance industry um, to, to develop common understanding of risk and um, um, insurability that um, might help with uh, encouraging a change in uh, land use? That'd be a good question for the folks like on the, in the Southeast, I you know, who are already losing coverage. I'm not, I, I haven't heard anything like that. I mean, that does make sense, but insurance companies like the railroad tend to operate um, fairly exclusively. I mean, yeah, there's the question locally at Tool if we should bring this up to our business and commerce committee or uh, I guess, I mean, the, the port, you guys have your uh, regional economic partnership role as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Yeah, we've we've had that discussion before with, you know, riverine flood properties and how even how real estate transactions occur, um, which I know is different than your insurance question. But there, you know, I think at least Whatcom County is not. Uh, yeah, there, there's that question. At what point do we reach out and kind of engage the private marketplace? Um, do we regulate? Do we communicate? What, you know, what's that? What's that look like? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for considering that. Now, I was just uh, wondering about why you're waiting for electeds to kind of digest, swallow the pill. Maybe the private sector might might be also open to um, this education and information. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good, good suggestion. Thank you for that. Um, I do see another question in the chat from Nathan, um, which is, to what extent is there an appetite for designing interventions on the basis of maximizing NPV of, of investment as opposed to targeting the 100-year hazard at some future year? 
Nathan, I see you came up on camera. Do you uh, want to add anything to that? Not necessarily. Um, although, I mean, you know, it's complicated by the uncertainty. And so, you know, maybe you want to do some, something that's regret informed. Um, but uh, yeah, no, is that something that, that that's like subject of, of discussion? Sorry, I'm kind of new in CHRN. So I'm, I'm not super familiar with where the discourse is. Um, is that something y'all talked about? Yeah, I mean, I, I can just give my my hip shot answer there. I mean, there it, it almost kind of piggybacks on a tools question to a certain degree of, you know, what is the role of local government in determining, you know, where people invest uh, invest their money or how how deep do we go into the private marketplace? You know, from a growth management act standpoint, you know, local governments are on a twenty year planning horizon even though you might buy a 30 year roof for your home, um, which feels significantly out of balance in my brain. Um, and to your point, yeah, I, I feel like uh, we should be the state, the local, we should be on a minimum hundred year planning horizon if we know these hazards, hazards exist and if we know they're gonna get worse. Um, so I think your question is right on in where we should be going. Um, I'm not fully clear on how to get there. And I think from a big picture standpoint, that would ideally be a federal or a state requirement um, or directive. But yeah, I mean, to a tools question, uh, I also don't understand why the private marketplace wouldn't similarly want to be better stewards of their investments. Thank you. Um... If this is of interest to anyone, I think that given the detail of the Cosmos data, making some simplified assumptions about depth damage relationships, and I don't think you have to pay to get, um, oh, I forget what the name of the data set was from the feds um, that's available at the structure level that, that might be useful for that. It should be a fairly, not too expensive of an exercise to get some very high level estimates um, yeah, using hazard assumptions for the depth damage relations, but you, there, there's there's more granular data that you can use than than the baseline hazard assumptions um, to to get relatively cheaply some um, some estimates of um, you know what you're what you're sort of paying for your buck is going to be in terms of uh, housing elevation and and you know uh, efforts like that. So if anyone's interested, you know, uh, I'd love to talk more about that at some point. Nathan. Thank you for that. And yeah, it does seem like there's plenty of opportunity for furthering this discussion and related discussions. And I really appreciate everyone's questions today. Thank you to Chris and Kurt and to our USGS folks for helping us out. And thank you, Charlotte, for always having so much wonderful information for everyone and everyone who helped answer questions in the chat. Um, yeah. Today was really great and I appreciate you all. This is being recorded and it'll be added to the Churn website. So if you had colleagues that couldn't make it today, um, they can always catch the recording. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you to everyone. Thank you.